So welcome, welcome, Ben. We so appreciate your consistent leadership and your solidarity today. And as always at Setsi, we begin all things by acknowledging and giving thanks to our creator, acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands we're on. We acknowledge all our ancestors, all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all our elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. So Ben, can you please introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers and share a bit about your remarkable work? Yeah, no, thanks, Victor. It's really great to be here. Love the work that you do and the consistency with just all the different folks that you're talking to around systems change and how to make things better uh, in Canada and beyond. So um, really excited about that. Grateful to be here. I'm Ben Weinlich, uh, coming from Edmonton, also known as Amiskwichiwaskahigan in Treaty 6 territory, uh, which is a traditional land where actually lots of diverse people uh, came together traditionally and we kind of try to keep that spirit of being in good relationship or we strive for that from different elders and um, leaders we've learned from to bring that spirit to the work that we do of trying to make things better in this space and beyond. So um, coming from Edmonton, I have a few hats I think maybe to talk about. I think, you know, part of what drives me that underlies all of them is I strive to help people, organizations and systems to hopefully problem solve better because I think that uh, we need to get better at that stuff to make sure that we're problem solving the right challenges and not just doing band-aid solutions and that we're making things better, not just for a select few, but striving to make it better for more folks and not leave anybody out as best we can. Um, so I think that kind of underlies the work. I've worked and studied and been an ally and tried to do my best to do change for most of my career in the disability rights and service space. So I have a brother with a severe disability and that was a big influence um, kind of getting into that space to make things more humanized. And it was an area where there didn't seem to be people with intellectual disabilities, there still haven't been really their liberation movements like a lot of other movements. And so that was an area of kind of as a, a younger person back in the day wanting to figure out where can I make change in the world that's meaningful and it's kind of grounded and connected with experience with family and stuff like that. So that that's where I've done a lot of space. So I'm the executive director of Skills Society currently, I've been for about five years. I've been with the organization for 20 years and um, we're one of the, larger and longest serving community living organizations in the Edmonton area. <clears throat> We've been around 40 some years. It was started by families that said, um, our sons and daughters with developmental disabilities deserve to be part of community, not institutionalized. And organizations like Skills uh, popped up, which actually that type of work, the community living movement to move people from institutions to community, that's a new human phenomenon in the last 50 to 60 years, stuff like that didn't really exist. People were supported by families and and uh, more oppressive institutions and things like that. So that so that being part of that innovative work, that's always been kind of core to the disability rights and service movement. There's a lot of social innovation work that actually has started in this in the disability space. Um, leaders like Alan Mansky um, and others that have helped kind of steward the way in that. So there's been so that that work where we have about 500 employees, we serve 450 folks through the Edmonton area, each person kind of lives in their own um, living arrangements and we help people be part of community and we do a lot of innovation work around it. The other thing I guess um, I help steward and try to try to do decent work in is around this social innovation work or social innovation lab work. And we were some of the early pioneers that um, started one of the early social innovation labs in Western Canada called the Action Lab, but it actually started earlier when we were doing think tanks, inclusion think tanks around intellectual disability. And we were, I guess, doing some early stuff trying to blend uh, in the disability space. It's called person-centered planning, which means the individual and their family is centered in the care plans that are developed. And uh, early design approaches, systems approaches, creative problem solving approaches to basically try to help people have better inclusion experiences in community and not be marginalized and left out. And so that led to, we did a whole bunch of where I did my graduate work around that. And then we started to get asked to help other groups with kind of thinking differently because it's such an area where human services needs to break open our minds to think and do differently. And um, 
that led to the creation of the Action Lab, where we have a portfolio of labs on all kinds of complex subjects from the CMHC Future of Home Lab that we steward um, around inclusion and uh, for people with disabilities and different models there. We're piloting a project out of that coming soon. And <clears throat> for five years, along with our partners, Edmonton Community Foundation um, and five co-stewards, we stewarded a five-year anti-racism lab that focused on behavior change work. So that's not just me, that's a whole, we had a community collective working on that. And we used behavior change science and um, systems and design approaches and indigenous epistemologies led by Jody Callahu Stonehouse to um, be able to kind of look at what can help at interpersonal and systemic and community levels. So it's like, it's a broad, I guess, a broad bunch of work, but I think the thing that ties it together is doing our best to try to support, you know, meaningful change in areas that uh, people say, you know, we need to focus on the right challenges and not just the band-aid solutions. That's remarkable. And I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> when trying to do system change work, bandages never work. I grew up in a community yeah. that I saw a lot of band-aids um, for problems that respectfully should have deserved a lot more resources, attention, and priority. And I think sometimes totally. band-aid solutions are almost disrespectful to some of the communities. So, so once again, I applaud your remarkable leadership and tenacity and daunting work, but also all the context that you provide around the years of capacity strengthening serving community and finding ways to innovate and pivot to better serve community. So once again, I applaud your remarkable visionary leadership. So my next question, what inspires you right now in your work? What has you curious or what's keeping you up at night? First thing it makes me think of, um, I think it was, a. there's some quotes from in the art space, Chuck Close, um, famous artist, um, does like amazing portraits and stuff. And I remember hearing something about like, something to the effect of don't wait around for inspiration you know we have to look for it and i do so i like this question because i do think that there's sometimes a tendency that it's almost like we want to be entertained by inspiration or we wait for it to happen and i think the the real inspiring ones they look for it and they try to see it everywhere you know and so that's the first thing that kind of comes to mind sort of as a meta thing around it um what's inspiring these days there's a lot i would say some of the work that some of my colleagues um, that, that are stewarding around um, the future of home lab. So Rebecca Rubilak, Paige Reeves, they're doing studies around how do we support deeper belonging and what mechanisms and systems create that. So I'm inspired by some of the work of my team that is um, really co-designing this alongside people with disabilities. And you can look at all that work on our actionlab.ca web. So I think some of that is inspiring. Um, I'm inspired by people that don't take themselves seriously, but take the work seriously. I think we need, there's an element of we need joy and laughter in this like really tough work of systems change. And I think we've sort of maybe lost some of that along the way because, you know, we're all, we're facing tough stuff. And so it's not to make light of things, but I think there's something that I'm inspired by when I meet with colleagues and we're working on some tough stuff that, that bring joy to it. And in particular, Indigenous colleagues that, you know, a sign of, I think a sign of wisdom around it is they're, they're laughing, they're talking about really deep human things. They're trying to kind of work on those pieces and help others and lead in that way. And they're doing it with robust joy that's not an oversimplified making fun of not that kind of thing but it's about often there's a there's a piece of not taking themselves seriously and bringing laughter to it so i'm inspired by that i think we need that stuff especially as the world gets more complex more tough the stuff i worry about yeah it's probably stuff we're all worrying about the polarization the rise in that the rise of fascism that's coming up all over the world um all, all of those pieces keep me up at night and make me think, what's the world my kids are going to have? You know, those pieces. Um, I think I'm a little worried about distractions also. Like, I think with our phones that we're tied to, and it's just so easy to be pulled in so many directions. And what's that, what's that doing to our brains? And what's that doing to our attention? And what's that doing for how we can work together in good relationship in community? I think there's something there that we're 
we're all aware of that there's something there that might be there's some good things to it maybe that we can learn and connect but there's also ways that it might be fostering and fueling polarization and all kinds of stuff like that so i'm worried about that and i think i'm you know rigid stiff thinking patterns black you know being cut being stuck in black and white thinking patterns i think what i've learned from colleagues over time is in this complexity work or working on complex challenges if you get into binary this or that or you get stuck in those ways you're going to probably create some more harm or probably be more um stuck in your own ego of what the way um and so I think there's something about that we need to be aware of. At the same time, there are some things that we need to say, that's not okay, that stops, and we need to kind of draw some lines. But I think we need to be careful, especially with the rise in polarization of judging people and thinking we know exactly um, where they're at around it. So black and white thinking is one thing. No, that's very helpful, and I couldn't agree more. We're in such a deep state of not just polarization, but polycrisis. And we have to mitigate groupthink. We have to find ways and means to come together. But we also have to find ways and means of using some sense of understanding that not everything should be black and white. Like there, 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 is, there is a dynamism, a continuum when it comes to understanding. Um, and, and we have to find ways and means to deploy empathy, grace, compassion, yeah. mercy. You know what yeah. I mean? And, and some of these senses, oh. I think... Um, uh, are, are not available to folks on the on, on the far ends of any spectrum, you know? So so I couldn't agree with you more, on my friend. So my next yeah. question, what challenges and barriers are you facing in your work? And what are some of the approaches that you and your colleagues are taking to overcome some of these challenges and barriers? So I think one of the things, that, so we have an initiative coming up called the Future of Labs. Um, and it's coming up on Hollyhock in May and um, it's looking like so far from the expressions of interest about 70 folks from across Canada that are experienced with leading these these things called labs or that have been called uh, labs around complex challenges. Um, yeah, so one of the you know one of the things that we're questioning and the challenges in these lab approaches is some methods that are used kind of as a one size fits all method that doesn't work for all com complex situations so for instance using human-centered design as like this is the thing that we're gonna they came from kind of technical spaces and developing products and stuff like that and then trying to use it on you know working on poverty or anti-racism or all kinds of or disability rights or all these really complex challenges and it oversimplifying things and as colleagues um jody Calhoun stonehouse diane Rusin, and indigenous colleagues that have said you know the centering humans and everything is kind of a pretty westernized context and in indigenous worldviews it's actually more systems thinking that humans aren't the center it's this interdependent thing of all these different beings right that share space and so what are what are their perspectives in problem solving that are more holistic and not just focused on the on the human pieces so i think there's a lot of questioning and good questioning around what's working not working and what might be promising in these lab approaches and there's also not a lot of coherence around what exactly we mean by innovation labs. Um, there's some good things that we, don't, we, we probably shouldn't throw out yet. And there's a lot of things that we should throw out and we should figure out the next practice. And a lot of the stuff to throw out is this oversimplified thing like, you know, what is the right time scale to have a collective go through a process to work on some challenges? And is it really appropriate to do and it, you know, I think they were coming with good intentions of almost like a, from the tech space of doing a data lab um, jam on something, getting a bunch of data and doing a two day sprint. And, you know, you, you don't really want to do that on a really complex issue because it can, um, it can be harmful. And so, you know, how do we, how do we make sure we're really involving people? It's also what's the leadership and the power dynamics of who leads a lab process? Um, and um, who decides on what prototypes might go forward to piloting? Where did those ideas come from? All of those dynamics are really, we're, we're questioning and we're really looking at, and this collective's coming together, the future of labs to kind of think about what's working, not working, what do we need to do for the next, um, next 10 years of labs, if they're still even gonna be called labs. A lot around the world have changed from labs and they talk about, um, there's a trend in Europe around mission driven. So they're picking three areas 
and three or four areas and they're saying we're focusing on these and they're and they're using a lot of methods that were used in labs but they're not calling it that anymore and so there's a lot of there's a lot of um up in the air kind of what do we need to do around this so hopefully a bunch of diverse folks will come together and we'll we'll tackle this and not not that these will be the answers going forward but it'll just be an offering to say this is what this collective is thinking about or promising practices to look at that's incredible yeah uh, I'm, I'm really excited about that. So I actually heard about um, it recently from my colleague, Tony Sermon, um, because yep. we were having an event at the same time. So we had to shift um, a gathering that we oh, had. Oh, but, but sorry about that. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 that's remarkable work. Um, so it's a perfect segue to my next question. Do you have a set of key priorities right now in your work? Yeah, so, well, it depends on the, the hat I'm wearing and the type of work. Um, in the organization Skills Society, the Disability Rights and Service Organization, you know, some of the priorities that are emerging and co-created with the folks we support and our board and looking at all that, um, there are elements where we want to do practices and improve um, how we support deeper belonging of folks with intellectual disabilities in community. It is, it is, nobody's figured it out really. There are patterns and principles around it. And it's, um, we need to get better at it so that people are not left out on the margins. So that's an area where we're gonna be doing a whole bunch of work and co-designing that with folks we serve. And so that's a, there's a priority there. Um, there's a priority of getting to the next level of data and humanizing it. You know, there's a, there's a whole aspect. Um, I'm also the co-founder of something called My Compass Planning, which started 10 years ago and it's a, it's a social services case management tool that humanizes um, the case man social service case management interactions because so often people come into services and the case management is like people are a number. It's not humanized. It's not um, centering the voice of people served. And so we created this tool with a whole bunch of different organizations to recenter that and focus and make sure it's the only thing out there that actually has the person served um, being able to guide their care plans and they're involved. All the other tools are designed for administrators, which causes a real power imbalance, right? And so I'm really intrigued and our priority is I'm really working on how do we redesign the, the infrastructure, the architecture of those social service interactions. Because if we can redesign those interactions, um, we can hopefully create more equitable, um, empowering uh, experiences and outcomes for folks that are served. Um, so that that's a key. That's a key thing that is part of where that came from, and maybe is relevant in some of this, and was kind of a, a change in my mindset about oh, twelve. It's maybe twelve, maybe close to fifteen years ago. Um, there was a thing I was at, it was, and this is again coming from that technical space when we thought in the early, in the early stages, you looked in these technical spaces, it was a thing um, I got invited to at Pixar, it was called the Intersection Event, and it was um, a whole bunch of folks coming together, I don't know if you remember it or heard about it, and it was this, this whole, you know, a whole bunch of folks came together and from tech spaces and social services, and it was a two day kind of thing, and um, there was a famous design person, might have been Tim Brown or something, and he was talking about, um, you know, we need to think less about designing objects and more about um, designing behaviors or interactions, right? And and it was this, it was looking totally outside. Like I cut my teeth on Paulo Freire, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, like, like deep kind of like sort of. Um, take it to the streets kind of ways around disability rights stuff. And, you know, that, that was kind of where I was raised from and how, how you do that, that kind of change work. And we had done a lot around training and teaching and stories and empathy building and to figure, you know, to try to aim at, let's change attitudes through story and try to get this happening. And if we can just have our support workers thinking in new ways, then they're going to be more empowering in their practice and less oppressive and stuff like that. And often seeing that, you know, telling people, hey, these are the values we should have. Hey, please have these values. Hey, please have this perspective. Doesn't really work. Like it's so hard to change values unless maybe we're a bit younger and we're finding ourselves and all of that stuff. But it's it's really hard to shift that stuff. It's the hardest part of the iceberg and systems change to shift. And it's the area we want most, right? Um, and so he was talking about this funny story of like, 
he showed a picture of um, um, pictures on a train that was like um, from old European trains that were like, please don't, they were in, in bathrooms and they were basically like, please don't piss on the floor kind of things. Like, please hear these things, please don't do, please, we're trying to have a civilization here, don't piss on the floor. And all designed in these ways and um, didn't really work. And then he talked about um, at Schiphol Airport in the Netherlands, somebody years ago had painted a fly in the urinal. And for dudes, it was some simple thing that like putting the fly in the urinal was causing was causing people to clean up the mess by 80% or something like this in this simple in this simple kind of um, situation of cleaning up that mess without telling people a thing, but it works right. And so super weird outside of silos design oriented thing coming from this like activist kind of perspective but there was something about it that connected that was like maybe there's something in that not exactly but maybe there's something in that that we need to think about with systems change that is more designing interactions versus just please be this way please like here are the signs please do this please do that which doesn't seem to resonate and um, that became the seeds of what became my compass planning and has developed over 12 years, which was about how do we redesign the interaction. So even if you don't have the perfect rights based values that we want you to have as a, as a social worker, or a disability worker, we are going to design the interactions so that you see the person you can't help but center the rights of people because of the, how the interactions happen. Like, what if we could do that? What if we could support more of that? Um, and so that we could get people better um, outcomes and better experiences and support. And so that to me is a priority and how we do that because I think that's promising. Um, now, the tricky thing with it is you don't wanna be, you don't wanna be creepy with that type of behavior change science stuff where you're changing it. There's a real tension where you're changing things without people's knowledge. And that's one of the ethical dilemmas of our time to figure out. And it, I mean, we're all getting our brains um, changed a bit by by social media and all those different things right so there's an element of that that we need to be really careful of and it needs to be consensual around those pieces but there's something about that i'm prioritizing i think is really important is how do we redesign that architecture so again like and also i love where i the strange places that innovative ideas often come from that strange collision of possibilities why i love getting collective together because stuff you never thought was possible emerges when you get um, diverse perspectives to come together and that's I, I think that's a beautiful thing of labs that's still really important and i never would have thought a fly in a urinal thing would trigger a thing that became you know a better case management piece right but it's um I, there's something about that that stuff that is kind of fascinating and is a priority in some of this work I couldn't agree more. I think that there, but definitely I agree with all these algorithms and social engineering. There is a, a scary parts to um, over design, but in the same breath, we do have to find ways and means. Because remember, most cultures are cultures of oral tradition. Um, so storytelling and pedagogy of oppressed was one of my like that was one of my favorite texts. Um, as a frontline worker, and I remember years ago when I was working as a gang intervention worker, I never understood why the folks that were supporting the clients would either try and meet them at the courthouse or at their office. When we as young people, we meet our brothers coming home at the coffee time. So I was always like, why not build something like right, I mean, and why not censor it around like the intervention around a barbershop? Like you just came out to decrease recidivism. Let's give you a fresh haircut as soon as you come out yeah. as opposed to, you know, go meet your parole officer and get a job. And like, so once again, that empathy based framework of censoring the person, having the person design, um, I, I think is so important because I remember it just even any of my, my, my work in the social service sector early years when I was in my twenties, some young people had a whole team, like a clinical psychiatrist, a social worker, someone at um, Ontario Works. They have like 10, 12 people around them designing their life for them. <laughs> and there'd be this pushback and tension because totally. they didn't have enough say so, or in some instances, based off of a, of a plethora of challenges, lived experiences, there, there was this ignorance and apathy. You know what? I don't know. And I don't care anymore. Like, okay, where do you, where do you want me to go tomorrow? You're going to give me yeah. bus for you? You know what I mean? So I, so I think that um, I, I couldn't yeah. agree more and design thinking and labs around this type of innovation is so important. 
So um, I really appreciate all that context and brilliance. So it's a perfect segue to my next question. How do you feel about the future of social innovation in Canada? How do you feel about the future of labs in Canada? One of the great things about it is that it's not, none of this stuff in social innovation is a set, like it, it is a, a set discipline that has been around forever and it has to fit in these ways. Of course, we talk about it and we sometimes when we come up with definition of things and then we can kind of say, is that really the right definition? Like this is the, this is the conversation that's happening right now around labs. Like what exactly are they? What isn't a lab? What is and all that stuff? So I think what is exciting is really the future, we can build that together you know, around it. And I think that's really an important piece rather than coming from some old institutional kind of this is how it is and we have to fit with it. So I think that's really promising. The flip side that's kind of challenging is are we coherent with what we're trying to do? And is it going to be with how rapidly things are changing and how much is coming at us um, within Canada and around the world, climate change and all of the all of those pieces, will we be able to respond to it quick enough? Um, you know, is a, is a big challenge. But I think what's what's promising is we can build this together and hopefully we can have lots of different perspectives on that. So we build something that, that works for lots of different folks in Canada. I couldn't agree more. Well said. So my second last question, what is your ultimate goal and what does success look like and feel like to you and your colleagues? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, that's tough, you know, and in, the more um, in complexity, you know, the more it gets hard to describe it, but at the same time, I think we do need something to aim at. So I think, you know, some of the goals, um, you know, would be for some of the communities that I serve and work with and work alongside. It's about how do we support deeper belonging? How do we help people with intellectual disabilities um, really not be on the margins and really be accepted as they are, as they want to show up in community? So, you know, part of that is that people are, are, part of society, part of our social circles, part of our workplaces, you know, part of um, all institutions, right? So I think, you know, that's, that's an outcome um, that I'm focused on and want and want to support around. And, you know, part of what I'm also experimenting with alongside lots of colleagues is what are what are processes that are going to get to impact i think a lot of lab processes have got built a lot of relationships and connections which is awesome it's one of the pieces that we need for networking and being um, connected so we need that um, and i think we need to get a little better in terms of what can lead to impact and outcomes better and i don't think we've figured that out and i think there's um, a lot of experimentation which i think is promising and I'm hopeful of just people coming together to work on those problems of how it's a meta thing of working on the problem of how we solve problems better together, right? Because we need that. And I think there's a lot to learn from Indigenous colleagues around this. I love the concepts of two-eyed seeing, you know, um, that, you know, we've learned about from Jody Calhoun Stonehouse, um, Hunter and Jacqueline Cardinal, you know, around it of these different, I think we need that, especially in a Canadian context and where we share this land. So I think there's something really promising around that. And I think that can lead to some good outcomes too, if we if we do that ethically and have Indigenous folks centering and leading that. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. I couldn't agree more. So my last question, do you have any closing thoughts or calls to action for our listeners and viewers? Calls to action? Um, I mean, I guess keep considering you know, are we holding paradox as well? Are we holding complexity well? Are we slipping, ask ourselves if we're slipping into kind of stiff, rigid, black and white thinking or too many assumptions? Um, you know, I think that's a really important piece that we all need to be working on and getting better at. Um, think about and work on how we get better at collaborating because we're gonna need collaboration. We can't solve wicked challenges alone. And so call to action get involved in stuff. And I would say, you know, action, learning through action is better than sitting on the sidelines waiting for something to happen for us. And so even if it's not perfect, even if it's messy, even if we make mistakes, it's better to be involved in action and being bold to try things than to sit on the sidelines. That's what comes to mind in the moment. Thank you so much, Ben, for your candor, your brilliance. Um, your visionary leadership and yeah, the integrity that you hold and the space that you hold for so many and, and, and the work that you've been doing for so long. Really appreciate you investing some time with us. And as always at Setsi, we close the way we began by acknowledging and giving thanks to our creator. We acknowledge and give thanks to the original stewards, the various lands we're on. 
We acknowledge and give thanks to all our ancestors, all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We give thanks and honor all our elders, community stalwarts, whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. Thank you so much, Ben, for all that you do for so many. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. This is really great work that you do. Thank you for letting me be part of it for a moment. Indeed.